Our next guest is called El Nathan John. He's a Nigerian novelist. Um, he's written two books um, that I know of. Um, one is called Born on a Tuesday, which we'll talk about. Another is be called Becoming Nigerian. Um, he's been, um, he's a satirist. He's a recovering lawyer. Um, he's twice been uh, shortlisted for the Kane Prize for African writing. Um, if you hadn't gone through a terrible experience very recently, I'd say third time lucky. Um, we were going to have a real knockabout um, uh, conversation, but I first want to um, just tell you what happened to El Nathan on the way to this conference yesterday. Or rather, I'm going to get El Nathan to tell you very briefly. Should I come up there? No, let's sit down here. Okay. Um, so thank you very on. much. Your mic's up, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, El Nathan. Um, El Nathan John had the most difficult journey to this conference of anybody, uh, I can guarantee. And I'm sorry, not I'm, that difficult. I'm um, sorry to put you on the spot, but anyway, we'll get on to the good stuff in a minute. But just tell us briefly what happened to you. No, I came in like first class ambulance service, <laughs> NHS. Yeah, I had an incident on the plane, but, uh, but it's the first time I've come into the UK without having my passport checked, which is great. <laughs> so we can recommend this, yeah? Because, this yeah, because I go. came in from the plane straight onto the ambulance straight to Hillingdon Hospital, and uh, yeah, it's great, I tell you. <laughs> so you're always going to come this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's, um, uh, let's go back um, um, to basics. So let's start with this book, um, this book, Becoming Nigerian. What, t tell me a little bit about this book. What is this book? Well, first, it's a, it's a book that no one wanted to publish because it's a... Uh, a collection of satirical essays about Nigeria, political satire about Nigeria. It, a lot of it has come out in one you know, form or another, yes. in, in The Guardian, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it attempts to sort of x-ray power at, in the different incarnations that we can find it. And that it's very easy for political satirists to look at uh, po politics in the most traditional sense. Yes. Politicians and their wives often. Um, but people often forget the corners in which power lurk, and that in fact, whether it's in the middle class or among religious groups or in families, there are manifestations of power that the, the, the use of which can be as bad and sinister as you, know, you find in politics. Yeah, so I'm gonna get him to read out a little bit in a, in a minute, but, um, but first of all, I mean, I, I reviewed the book in the FT, and I called it, at one point, a backhanded love letter to Nigeria. And then I kind of wondered, because I thought, I mean, it is so searing. It is so critical. I thought, and you don't, even, you don't live in Nigeria now. Not Suddenly not. I thought, maybe it's not a backhanded love letter to, to Nigeria. Maybe it's a demolition job. Um, uh, uh, what, 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 which of those two? Well, Ni Nigeria, Nigeria is hard to demolish. Uh, <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that uh, being in an abusive relationship in Nigeria it's, it's also hard to leave. Right. Um, so you I, describe yourself as being in an abusive relationship yes. with Nigeria, yeah? Y yes. <laughs> because I, I still carry that green passport, so I am Nigerian everywhere I go. Uh -huh. So why is it a, an abusive relationship? I mean, what, 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 is, what is wrong with Nigeria? And, and where does the love letter come in? I mean... <laughs> I think there's a lot wrong with Nigeria, but one of the things I'm trying to do with the book yes. is to look at what is wrong with Nigerians. Okay. Um, and, and over time, and you can blame this on, on whether it's successive military governments or on a culture that has grown from great dysfunction, we have developed this culture. Yes. It's, and you find it in all you know, strata of society, whether it's in the, in the, middle, in the what I call the quasi middle class or even, even among people below. And we find it reinforced in society, reinforced everywhere. Everywhere where groups of Nigerians gather, you find this kind of attitude reinforced. This, this hustle. This the hustle. Thing, That's this what thing you're talking for about. Which the hustle. Yeah, this thing for which Nigerians are known, which a lot of us are proud of. And at some point I say, maybe it's time not to be so proud of it. It's, maybe it's time not to be proud of being the loudest person in the room. Not for a good reason, but for a yeah. bad reason. Uh -huh. Maybe not proud to be the most aggressive person in the room, not for a good reason, for a bad, you know. Maybe... Maybe there's a reason 
why our country is the way, the way right. it is. I mean, John was asking earlier about leapfrogging, you know, and yeah. was leapfrogging just a polite way of saying, you know, there's no infrastructure? Yes. I mean, is the hustle a polite way of saying, you know, there isn't that kind of social infrastructure, yeah. there isn't those public goods that the government should be providing, and therefore everybody's got a hustle? Yes, I mean, and we've, we've replaced, even, even among civil society, we've replaced real action with trying to find cracks through which we can we can go through right and and in, 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 what i've decided as a person is i i just refuse to whitewash this country anymore yes and i say look we need to start asking what is wrong with us as a people right why 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 are certain things commonplace wherever nigerians gather what is it that we have taken along with us and i find it even in, in diaspora groups where nigerians are gathered just take other people out of the room, and when, when Nigerians gather, Nigeria just immediately emerges. Yes. You know, and, and, I, and I say, well, it's not always a good thing. And that's why our politicians can get away with what they get away with day in, day out, and why things, are, things keep getting worse. But of course, some of us have positions of privilege being in some kind of middle class or being able to be mobile and move out of the country or move back in. And, and, you know, it's easy to say, you know, I want to talk about the nice parts of Nigeria. I want to sit with my middle class white friends and say to them, you know, our, 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 your country is bad as well. You know, you also have Brexit. You know, you have a clown <laughs> as prime minister. You know, I, I can do that all day. Uh -huh. you know, but does it but make where me, does it get you? Where yeah. does it get me? You know, and, and I say, you know, maybe it's for, for some people it's about being respected on the table with their middle class friends, with yes. their business partners, yeah. so that they don't look like the 70% of people in Nigeria yeah. who are hungry, who are being kidnapped, who are being raped and abused, who are being shot, who are being made to disappear, who are in jails because they have had a tweet out, who are in jails because they, they did a newspaper column. Yes. You know, they, they want to look nice, they want to wear a nice yeah. suit and say, you know, I'm. I'm also middle class. I'm like, I'm as posh as you are. Yes. You this know? reminds me, actually, and I will get you to read in a sec, of a conversation I had with Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who I, who I think is a wonderful author and is, a, is, is an amazing person in, in, in sort of every respect. But we ha I was complaining that I had not been able to get a visa to go to Nigeria for about a year, I think. And she said, good, because we can't get a visa to come to Britain. And I understand that. I understand that. Well, I, but I don't have sympathy for you today. Dude, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. But it, in a sense, you know, I mean, that's a bit of the same, isn't it? It's saying because you treated us bad, we're going to treat you bad. That's our that's our mm. revenge. But it doesn't actually do Nigeria any good, mm. I would argue. Anyway, why don't you read, read us? Uh, I asked you to uh, to think of a piece that would uh, delight and get the audience gasping. Okay. <laughs> um, I, three minutes. Three minutes is good. Three minutes, yeah. Three we're, minutes. We're happy, yeah. If you if you get bored, you can just like start leaving the room. I will. Why don't you stand up? Why don't you stand <laughs> I up? I can. Actually. Yeah, stand up there. Cool. Thank you. Also, they can see my white shoes. <laughs> I have, so I think I think I'll read a piece that is sort of the the premise of all of this. And yeah. It's, it's it's called the Gospel According to Nigeria, and it sort of sets the tone for what the rest of the book is. The Gospel According to Nigeria. Chapter 1. In the beginning, the British created the northern and southern protectorates. Now the nation was formless and empty, and darkness covered our collective identity. And the British said, let there be Nigeria. And there was Nigeria. And the British saw that Nigeria was good for them. And they separated the ruling class from the serfs. And the British said, just as we have a vault between us and you, let there be a vault to separate the rulers from the citizens. So the British created Nigeria in their own image. In the image of their colonial rulership, they created it. Oppressed or unoppressed, they created them. And there was independence from the British, and there were coups and counter-coups, and there were military dictators. And the decades passed, and the military rulers stripped their garbs and uniforms and transformed into civilian rulers, and they declared, all things have passed away, all things have become new. Chapter 2. For our military dictators loved the country so much that they gave up their only begotten uniforms and the right to make decrees, that whosoever believed in them and voted for them should be stuck with them until their old age. I shall skip a few chapters. <laughs> Chapter 4. For the shameless will inherit the land and they will dwell in it in an abundance of peace. For the shameless, instead of shame, there shall be a double portion. For the wicked, instead of 
and corrupt instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. They shall have everlasting joy, and in their old age shall be called elder statesmen, and the last shall be the first. The benevolent, the, chapter 6, the benevolent dictator is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in hunger and fear, but only because it leads me to righteousness. <laughs> he refreshes my soul. He guides me along his own path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley with no electricity, I will fear no evil, for he is with me. His rod and his staff with which he makes hundreds of Shiites disappear, they comfort me. Chapter 7, blessed are those who steal from the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of political rebirth. Blessed are those who make people like Shiites mourn, for they will be comforted by dead putrefying bodies. Blessed are those who despise the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those with good political alliances, for even when they are caught, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who hate the poor, pure in heart, for they will see the inner, halls of the, the inner walls of the villa. Blessed are those who trend political hashtags, for theirs is the kingdom of bank alerts. Blessed are the kidnappers, for their ransom money will come intact and without repercussion. Blessed are those with a long career of theft and destruction, for they will be called elders. <laughs> and the last chapter I will read here is the Lord's Prayer according to Nigeria. The benevolent dictator gathered all his disciples and taught them a new prayer. He said, you must pray then this way, our Father, who art a liquid and gote, hallowed be thy wealth, <laughs> thy monopolies come, thy will be done in this government as it was in the previous ones. <laughs> give us this day your refinery as we give you cheap dollars. <laughs> Forgive us our suspicions as we have forgiven those who are suspicious of us. And lead us not into temptation to break your monopolies and empower other entrepreneurs, but deliver us from the evil ones who challenge your government. For thine is the sugar, the flour, and the cement, and rice, and spaghetti, forever and ever. Amen. So what do middle-class Nigerians make of your books? I mean, you're excoriating them, aren't you? Uh, are you a hated figure in Nigeria? Nah, not really. You know, <laughs> the thing is, I think the effectiveness of satire is directly proportional to the ability of a society to feel shame. Uh -huh. And <laughs> we are in some sort of post-shame dystopia. <laughs> and that is why... I find increasingly, you know, I, I ask myself, because I'm, I'm quite critical also of satire and of, of its increasing popularity. Uh, people often ascribe to satire the powers that it doesn't have. Uh -huh. um, and, and I say to people, you know what, it's, it is important to excoriate people, to say, to, 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 to call out people. Yep. But what is the effect, really? You know, are people laughing along with you? And I, and I, I criticize satire not just in Nigeria, but generally. I was, I, one, of my, one of the examples I like to give is when John Stewart was leaving, uh, and I don't think John Stewart is a satirist, but his work has sort of been likened to satire. Uh -huh. But when he was leaving the, 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 the Daily, Daily Show, show mm. um, what happened? He, he, had, he had farewell speeches from all of the people he'd been excoriating. Right. Billy O'Reilly was there together with Hil Hillary Clinton, together with John McCain, and saying, oh my God, we're going to miss you, you know? Right. And they did a whole video, and it was all nice, and it was all hugs. And, so it's a little bit and, too and comfortable. That. And I'm like, you know, like Peter Cook said here, in, in, in the UK, yeah. you know, are, are we sinking, giggling into the sea? Yes. You know, are we replacing, are, or are we thinking that we weaponize laughter? We've weaponized mockery. We've said to people, if we can, if we can laugh at, at, at Boris Johnson's hair, you know, maybe we're doing some sort of activism, you mm. know? If we can call Trump whatever names we call him, maybe, you know, maybe this is some sort of, you know, resistance, you know, and, you know, but, but is it really? Does it take the place? Are we ready to give up some of, our, some of the things that make us comfortable? Yes. The things... And your book is uncomfortable in parts, isn't it? I mean, there were parts when I went, whoa, he's gone a bit far, but that's presumably what you wanted me to feel. I mean, 
I, the more uncomfortable, the better, but I have no <coughs> illusions about what I'm doing. You yeah. know? I do not think in any way that I'm bringing down you know, people in power or that I'm some... Even fellow Kuti couldn't do you know, that. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I always say to people, you know, what we do is, it might be important, but what is even more important is that we ask ourselves what things we can do to make sure that the societies that we live in become yes. not just better places, but, but, but that we... How can we build a more humane society? Yes. How can we... Because what we have today is unsustainable. Everywhere in the world, the way our economies run, the way politics is run, it's, it's unsustainable. The way our environment is, it's it, unsustainable. In the time that's remaining, let me go back to your first book, yes. or, or, or the first one that, that, that anyway. The, one, the first one you know. The first one I know, exactly, mm. yeah. Um, Born on a Tuesday. Yes. Um, very well reviewed. It's about um, a kid in northern Nigeria who is um, tempted by radical, radicalization, rad, radical religious views because of, you know, I mean, the, the, the opening line is, you know, he's sleeping under a tree and they're recounting how they killed people, I think. is I mean, it's worded better than that. Um, they used to, anyway, you'll, you'll remember better than I do. T t I mean, this in a sense is a more, I mean, it's not a book of satire. It's a, it, mm. it's a novel in which some of these very difficult um, uh, ideas are, uh, are discussed. First of all, what were you able to do in fiction that you, that you think you couldn't do if it was just a, a non-fiction account of Boko Haram, let's say, in northern Nigeria? I mean, f what fiction allows me to do is it allows me to look at the, the human condition, the human component of, of, of the crisis that we have. It allows me to go into the hearts and souls of the people that are often forgotten in crises like this, when they become numbers and statistics, yes. when they become uh, phenomena to be examined. Um, and people often forget that there are people with, with lives who love, who hate, who eat, who sleep, who have aspirations and desires like everyone else. And so that a conflict zone isn't just photos of nameless people. Mm -hmm. It is actually human beings who but for the condition that they find themselves, could be anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's what fiction allows me to do. It allows me to strip, uh, or to stay, go and leave all of the politics behind and ask, you know, what is the effect on the human being yes. of all of this? So the boy at the center of the book is called Dantala, is that right? Yeah, um, Dantala, yeah. What, um, what, what could be done in the real world, <laughs> the real world of northern Nigeria or Nigeria as a whole, to prevent Dantala being exposed, being um, uh, tempted, I guess, um, by, by that oh, world. Come on. I'm not the vice president of Nigeria. <laughs> I'm a novelist. If I knew, I'd be running for office. Um, but no, but, but seriously, I, I think that uh, northern Nigeria, like, many, like every part of Nigeria, has immense challenges that are the product of you know, many years of dysfunction. However, what is happening now is because of the, the failure from the top yeah. to first understand the problem, to be interested in, you know, they're immune from any sort of criticism. You know, you can say whatever you want to say, pe business just goes on as usual. Right. You know, and so for instance, something that's been said about Nigeria is there's more poor people in Nigeria than in India. More, um, more, more extreme poor. Yeah, under 190 a day. Uh, under one one dollar ninety mm -hmm. a day, which is the World Bank. Um, I mean, that is so shocking, given that Nigeria, mm -hmm. for all its um, self-image as being a big, big country, mm -hmm. is a very small country compared to India. Um, you know, in population terms, uh, mm -hmm. it's one sixth of the population, yeah. and yet it has more extremely poor people. And India was a country that we associated with extreme poverty. And um, you'd have thought that was such a shocking statistic that mm -hmm. it would be being kind of uh, addressed at the highest levels, and yet it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Even rhetorically, it doesn't seem to be to me. Mm -hmm. one, one of the disadvantages I think we have is the, size, the sheer size of the country. Yeah. It's very easy for you to ignore what's going on and still have a lot to show. Yeah, you know? yeah Lagos you know, is happening. You, you have Lagos, a city of 22 million people. Yeah. And even if you want to talk about Lagos for the next year, you will not, have, you will not run out of material. Sure. And so it's very easy for, like, for you to have this great dysfunction happening and the country crumbling and sinking but have like great Lagos stories to show. Yeah. You know, it is, it is possible. Um, um, also, we have, like I said, a, a sort of quasi middle class that has learned to fend for itself. Yeah. 
No they one don't. relies, no one waits for government, no one relies on government. We fend for ourselves. We say, how do we make the best of a bad situation? So there's traffic here. What can we do in this traffic? We can sell stuff in traffic. Mm -hmm. And so if you come as a philanthropist and say, oh, I want to patch the potholes here, the people who've made a business around the traffic will say, well, what, what are you doing? Yeah. You do the potholes, they dig it up the next day. They're like, how can you ruin our business? <laughs> you know, because the economy, these, you know, these side economies are actually tied to, to our yeah, dysfunction. Yeah, at a big, at a higher level, I wonder about people who own generate, g companies that make generators. Yeah. They don't really want you to have access to electricity on the grid, I would have thought. Well, I don't think they'll be pleased. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, that, a, yeah. that's the same example. But you know, whether it's smuggling uh, of rice, you know, a, a lot around the Bene border, or, uh -huh. it's, or, it's, or it's importation of generators, or it's, or it's the people who are I would say the international development hustlers, you know, who need these jobs to survive, you know, who need, they need these big success stories in mm -hmm. Nigeria with these international development projects. All of this, you know, is, the dysfunction feeds all of this. It, it feeds each, of, each and every one of these things. And now it feeds things like banditry and kidnapping, which is quite lucrative. You know, there's been a deregulation of, of, of crime. Mm -hmm. And now anybody can kidnap, you know, you just think, ah, you know, that guy, we know he just made $10,000, you know, why don't we just, you know, make him spread it around. And now, you know, regular criminals just like, they're doing kidnapping because it's, it's very, it's not as high risk as other types of armed robbery. Right. You know. Just very briefly, I know novelists, you know, writers hate to talk about this, but, but what, what, can you give us an idea of what you're working on now? Uh, no, I don't, I don't hate to talk about this. Actually, I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm... So I have a graphic novel coming out next month. Okay. Um, I'm, I have a graphic novel coming out after that as well. That is going to be a sequel to that one. Okay. Um, so two graphic novels. Two graphic novels. I also have a novel that I'm trying to sell, which is, a histo which is historical fiction set in the 1800s in northeast Nigeria. So somewhere around uh, Bauchi Ningi, uh -huh. which uh, sort of looks at a, a rebellion that, that happened sometime between 1847 and, and, and 1900, which is a counter story to the deification of the Sokoto Caliphate as being yes. all that. And looking at all of the rebels that actually found the Sokoto Caliphate oppressive, especially in the, in the last half of, of, of the sort of heyday of the, of the Caliphate. Right, which is, that's the Sokoto Caliphate that moved into Kano, is it? Uh, did it well, the Kano was part yeah, of the Sokoto yeah, Caliphate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so looking at the rebels, but then more than that, looking at the for, sort of forgotten uh, characters in history, like, like all of the wives of the, the rebel leaders who nobody talks about. Where yeah. were they? Who were they? You know, what part did they play in the rebellion? You know? And then also x-raying um, how Sokoto Caliphate was in fact essentially a slave economy. You, by m many estimates, one out of four people in the heyday of the Sokoto Caliphate was an enslaved person. 25% yes. of the entire population, some say as much as you know, 30, 40% of everybody walking at a time when the Sokoto Caliphate was made up of 10 million people were, were enslaved. What did, what did this do to people? Yes. And, and, and how, 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 do, how can we think of, because it's not that long ago, you know, what, we're talking of the 1800s. Yeah. Um, what, did, what did it, what did this did, what did, uh, my English is finished. <laughs> what did this do to people? Yes. You know? And does it still linger in exactly. a sense? Exactly. Yeah. What, what, how has it affected power relations? How has it affected groups in Northern Nigeria and their yeah. position relative to one another in the way they w operate with religion, with culture, yes. with language, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. Fascinating. I mean, I would love to go on. I've got to, I've got to wrap it up. I think you've got to, just an insight there into... Buy the book. <laughs> yeah, buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. It's amazing that you came. Thank you. I hope I didn't embarrass you.